for me, um, this is a 100%, okay? I know we should never say 100% in dentistry. <laughs> okay, the 99%er, that the fixed movable attachment is always on the distal aspects of the anterior retainer. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode, this time with Professor Paul Tipton. Listen, if you've ever been a student or uh, in your foundation year and you want to find out more about fixed prosthodontics, you turn to Google and you start searching about bridges. You can't get very far on Google without coming across Paul Tipton's papers. And the episode, by the way, is absolutely full of bridge work gems, which I think are so helpful. So we're going to talk about all things fixed movable bridges, uh, the common uh, mistake areas that dentists make when it comes to bridge work and bridge design. Uh, we also talk about grooves. So my protrusive dental pearl for you is when you're placing grooves for crowns, place them mesial and distal. When you're placing grooves for bridges, place them buckle and lingual, or buckle or lingual. Same with the mesial distal, it's mesial or distal, or mesial and distal. Does that make sense? Uh, anyway, we go into it in more depth. So to find out exactly why those rules exist, then uh, you'll have to listen all the way to the end of the episode, because towards the end of the episode, we discuss all that. But there's so many gems in, in the, the meat and potatoes of the episode is basically about fixed movable bridge work, uh, the nuances of it, when to choose it, what are the contraindications to fix movable bridge work. It's actually interesting actually that, that fix movable bridge work is the default design that uh, Prof Paul Tipton says. And actually you should be finding reasons not to do it and then therefore settle for fix fix. Whereas in, in dental school we don't really get taught or certainly my experience is that we didn't really get taught that much and I never placed a fix movable at dental school. So I hope you find this episode useful and I'll join you in the outro. Prof. Professor Paul Tipton, thank you so much for coming on the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you today? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, looking forward to a sunny day. Hopefully we'll have some good weather today. Good weather and, and, and a good chat ahead. So for those listening in, in the future years, we're coming to the end of lockdown. We're starting to get back we into hope. work. Uh, you've been doing uh, great things in the education uh, part of you know, teaching, educating dentists all over the world, which is usually what you do, this time using the power of uh, the internet. I saw your video right at the beginning of lockdown, and that got thousands of views you know, saying that, you know, let's make a difference, let's provide some education. So how's that journey been for you, providing education you know, pretty much on a, almost a daily basis? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been pretty tiring. Um, we had... Uh, four people who are working for me. So at the moment, we've got sort of obviously no income because we're not doing courses. Uh, but rather than furlough all the staff, we put our four uh, main guys with us to work doing something else for the profession. So what we've been doing is trying to give uh, free webinars, free education to the profession during this, this time. Uh, and in some days, I think it was today, we've got three uh, webinars on, one at nine o'clock, one at uh, one o'clock, and one at three o'clock. All, all bases covered, and I have to say the caliber of the speakers you've had on uh, have been great, and I think it's, it's, it's wonderful what you put on for everyone. So, so uh, you know, for, on behalf of the profession, uh, thank you. But today we want to touch on something that uh, I know very uh, dear to you, and I, and, and I can only assume that because the reason I want you to speak about this topic is as a student, I remember Googling about bridges, and you, you can't get very far on Google about Googling about fixed prosthodontics and bridges without seeing your name plastered everywhere and seeing your papers uh, that, you, that you post on your, on your website and stuff. So you are definitely someone who, who, who would be a great person to speak about this. Uh, you know, we could have picked up many of topics that we could have, but let's just home in on, on one and that's bridges. Um, so the first question I'm going to ask you, Prof, is I think, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, is, is my perception, I see that from what I understand, people who used to do the, the master's courses at Eastman, for example, in the 60s and 70s, it used to be lots of fancy bridge work and whatnot. And then implants came along, and then we went more as a profession, more towards implants. But do you think now that perhaps dentists are becoming a bit more case selective about their implant cases, and that the role of bridges has become, has resurfaced again? Is that is that a fair comment? Yeah, I think that's a very fair comment. I think it's happened... Uh, everything in your life, uh, Jazzy, if you live long enough, everything in your life comes full circle. Uh, I mean, everything. You know, flared trousers come back into fashion. Um, I, we can talk about something that you were talking to Jason about, vertipreps. Suddenly they're back in fashion. Uh, yet in the 60s and 70s, they were being done. So yeah. everything comes back around. Uh, and I think the, the major um, stumbling block for implants has been in the last 10 years, the rise of, of peri-implantitis. And if we look maybe 10 to 20 years ago, 
we would have taken the Brandenburg studies and would say to our patients, yes, you've got um, 90% success rate over 15 years. There's no reason why that should not last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, that's all changed. Uh, talk to any uh, implantologist who are worth their salt now and ask them the question, how long is my implant going to last? And most of them will be saying, well, maybe 15 years. I'm not going to say anything more than that because we don't know. Uh, and that's our problem. So that brings it then into the realms of bridge design as well, because I wouldn't be doing a bridge for somebody unless they really push me um, without saying this should last 15 years plus. It's fixed prosthodontics. Mm -hmm. I do my fixed prosthodontics from um, a science base. We know what works in the science, and therefore there's no reason why my fixed prosthodontics should not last a minimum of 15 years. So I think we've got this now lovely situation where bridge work and implants will probably be lasting the same amount of time. So we can be very selective with which cases are the right ones to do and you say you've got a, a missing six and a low sinus, do you put the patient through sinus grafting and an implant when the seven behind's got a large MOD and the five in front's got a large MOD, for instance? Or is it better long-term to do a fixed bridge there or fixed movable bridge and take the patients away from having the surgery done? So I think the, your question's a fabulous one. And I think, yes, implants are going down a little bit, Bridges are coming up, and now we can be very case selective. Our one major problem, mm. however, is that people don't understand bridge design. It's not taught. And therefore, you know, there's myself, obviously, that, that lecture about it. There's probably one or two more, but not that many. And so you go through university, and most of the time, the university guys are still saying uh, anti's law. And anti's law got defunct Absolutely. many, many years ago. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not taught. It's and yet, very true. And that's why when I was Googling about to find out more knowledge about bridges, and that's when I learned about you, Prof. And that's where you came into my radar. And I've been uh, to a couple of your educational events, which are very, very good. Uh, and that's what we can explore further in bridge design. So, you know, you're, you're someone who's been uh, educating dentists for, for, for several years. What is the most common area of, of, of lack of knowledge, let's say, or the common myth that you want to bust or, or, or the uh, weakness area? I mean, yes, in general, you, you've touched on very nicely there that, yeah, bridges are not taught as well as they perhaps should be, anti's law. So anti-law could be one of them. Are there any other misconceptions that young dentists may have because of the lack of training about bridges that really might you know, annoy you? Yeah, I think uh, if, we, if we just go back a little bit, yeah. so mm -hmm. a bridge will involve doing usually, not always, usually a full crown preparation or a fairly largest preparation. The first myth is that all young dentists are taught from a very early age, it appears, that if you do a crown prep, then you're gonna have 20 to 30% of those going non-bite. Okay, and I wanna just throw that away. That so you're touching on the science. Saunders and Saunders sort of uh, uh, the paper yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, that's not the science. The science shows us those studies are done without teeth being vitality tested before they were crowned. Now, if you vitality test before crowning, and you're quite stringent with those vitality tests, and if you get a non-vital response, you do a root filling, that drops down to about 5 to 6%. And that's some French studies that the French are quite big on, on uh, root filling before they do crown work. But they've got some good studies there. So that's the first myth. And that drags itself then into fixed bridge work, whereby dentists don't want to do a bridge because they're worried about the tooth losing its vitality. Well, you know that saying, Prof, um, uh, crowns kill teeth, bridges kill them faster. Is, is there any truth to that? Um, there can be if it's not done properly again. So uh, we then come a little bit more into the nuances. And uh, I suppose one of the myths is that all bridges should be fixed fixed. Uh, and I teach an awful lot about fixed movable bridges. And one of the, the great aspects about fixed movable is that you don't have to get both abutments parallel. So you've got your typical uh, missing a lower six, your five's looking like that, your seven's looking like that. To put a fixed bridge in, you have to now really over-prepare that seven, okay? But what we're talking about more and more, uh, and this has been around for a long time, fixed movable isn't something new, but again- But it's not taught, it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the issue. It's not, it I was never taught about it. Yeah, prepare it down its long axis. So we now have one path of insertion for one tooth, one path of insertion for the other, 
They join together with a stress breaker called the fixed movable uh, part. And that means that you don't have to over prepare. It's now just like doing two crowns. Now, you can't do that for every single case. But when I, I lecture to my, uh, my students, I go and say to them, you've probably been taught that you're going to do a posterior bridge today for the patient. Um, you've been taught that some posterior bridges should be fixed movable, but you can't think why. Therefore, you'll do it as a fixed fixed bridge. OK, I think that's the, the thought process that goes to a lot of, of, of dentist might. I would like them to choose the opposite scenario, OK, to, to get a complete shift and say it's a posterior bridge. It is therefore fixed movable. And there are one or two reasons why it should be fixed fixed. And if they do that, you'll have far better success rates long term than just doing everything fixed fixed. Well, let's just emphasize what you said there. I think what you said there is really great. So by default, when we're thinking about uh, bridge work, the, what you're saying is that the default option option actually should be the fixed movable. And, and you should have to justify the few reasons where perhaps that's not suitable and you should be going for fixed fix. So right. which are those uh, couple of reasons where actually uh, we should be doing fixed fix and, and, and not the default? And I'm gonna, we'll get into a bit more about the nuances of fixed movable. But what are the contraindications to fixed movable? The, the major contraindication is mobility. So if one tooth is mobile, then it should be fixed fixed. Otherwise, by having two abutments together and one of them's mobile, you'll get an increase in mobility. So that's that's the major one. There are some smaller ones, such as the fixed movable usually means there's going to be metal showing in the joint, which to some patients, especially in the lower jaw, may be a contraindication. Um, if the opposing tooth, so the pontic or distal abutment, isn't there, then the fixed movable can actually over erupt. Mm. That's a contraindication. And the other one is length of span. So very, very long bridges are not ideal to be um, fixed movable because that puts too much stress on the distal abutment. Is that like a, a ratio for, for example, uh, can you do, let's say we've got a lower right four and you're missing the lower right five and six, Four to the seven, is that the limit yeah. or uh, yeah. would you so say? Generally, we would say that, again, very generalization. Yeah, of course. All three unit posterior bridges, fixed movable. All five and six unit posterior bridges, fixed, fixed. The four unit is the, the transition area where we have to look at other things such as mobility, um, such as the quality of the abutments, et cetera, et cetera. Brilliant. Well, then before we go into a bit more on fixed movable, what you haven't mentioned yet is uh, cantilever. So what are your thoughts on uh, conventional cantilever bridges? Let's say we have a, a missing six and you've got a heavily restored seven um, and the five is unrestored. Yes, you could do a, a fixed movable, uh, I'm, I'm sure. But what about the, you know, just cantilevering off the seven to replace the six? Uh, are you concerned about the talking? We'll talk about mesial versus distal cantilever as well. Uh, tell us about your thoughts on cantilever bridges. Okay, so um, generally cantilevers work very well. So cantilever bridge work is the only um, bridge work where we now design it going back to Ante's law. Okay, so Ante's law has gone out of the window apart from cantilever bridges. And, and, and quite a nice uh, um, uh, resume of, of Ante's law. Um, we know that periodontal um, ligament space of the uh, abutment tooth should be equal to or greater than the, um, the teeth that were being replaced. Um, interestingly, in Ante's law, Ante also talks about fixed movable bridges. And that is 1926 paper. Uh, mm -hmm. And fixed movables being advocated by Ante. Nobody picks up on that. <laughs> but if you read the paper, he talks every single posterior bridge ideally should be fixed movable. So that, that's the sign. Um, so we know that cantilevers work very well, but we now have to go by Ante's law. So at the front of the mouth, fine. We all have done uh, central, um, central upper central, lateral upper canine, no problem. As we go to the back of the mouth, the only realistic time where a cantilever would be okay from Ante's law point of view would be a premolar off a molar. So I'm very comfortable doing a five off a six, or if the five's missing and the six has come forward, a four off a six. So we move on to your question, which is the six off a seven. So what's been found with those is that, and these are um, Swedish studies, 
Lundgren, people like that, um, they've found that it depends what's in the opposing jaw. Because if you have a six coming off a seven and you have a lower six, which is um, there, it's not splinted to anything, it can over erupt. What will tend to happen over a period of time is the lower six will over erupt by a few microns, that's all. And the pontic will then be in hyper occlusion. As the pontic's in hyper occlusion, then that will put a torquing force on the distal abutment. And there's a possibility that we can start to get orthodontic movement of that seven due to the over eruption of the six. So one of the ways in which you could do, I'm not saying don't do these, one of the ways in which you can do this is to continually go back every six months and adjust either the lower six tooth or the upper six pontic. Keep it in that hypo, not hyper occlusion. Another way would be, let's just say, for instance, the lower tooth is a bridge of uh, pontic or bridge abutment. It can't over erupt, and therefore, yes, you can do a six off a seven. Keep the six gently out of occlusion, or again, hypo occlusion, and then you don't get the over eruption. So you can do these. It very much depends on what's happening in the opposing jaw. Just to, to uh, clarify on that, if you have um, a lower six and we're worried about it over erupting into an upper six pontic, um, then if we design it so that it's a very light contact in MIP and no excursions, um, why is it that they still over erupt? Um, if we look at a vertical dimension generally, teeth are always over erupting. So we have these compensatory mechanisms that are going on all the time. And we have this, we have a little bit of tooth wear and we have over eruption. So that's alveolar bone growth and cementum deposition. Happens all the time throughout life. Slows down in the older patient, much more quick in the younger patient. So everything I'm doing, if I've got an older patient, I've got a much greater chance of um, being able to work with that patient to stop the over eruption because it's not happening quickly. So what happens is we bite on the upper pontic Okay, and straight away, the upper pontic will move slightly because we're biting on it with a bolus of food. Okay, it will stay there. It will spring back at some stage, but we will also have then a micron or two of over eruption. So this over a period of time has a cumulative effect. And those compensatory mechanisms just going on all the time. I, lo I love your fantastic, direct, good answers. I'm, I'm really enjoying this chat. So, okay, so one thing I spent a long time researching once upon a time was to find the evidence base for mesial cantilevers versus distal cantilevers. Because in a mechanical and physics viewpoint, it makes sense that distal cantilevers are, are, are not great, especially posteriorly. All those talking forces, it just, it doesn't make sense. And I think it might be, I, I'm guessing it might be one of those things that we'll never really get evidence for. And it's a bit like, we know that we don't need evidence that if you jump out of an airplane without a parachute, that sort of thing. Am I right in thinking that actually that we don't need evidence for that or we'll never be able to get evidence for, for such a study like that and that distal cantilevers by the nature of the forces are, are tend to be avoided? Yeah, I, I think that there's certain things in dentistry we're never going to be able to prove, as you say. Um, just that we can't prove them also means we can't disprove them. So it doesn't mean because we can't prove something that it's not right. Uh, and sometimes you might look at it completely differently and say, OK, you go ahead and disprove me. You can't disprove me. Therefore, what I'm doing is OK. So we've got that sort of status quo in science generally. Um, so we've got two things happening with the distal cantilever versus the mesial cantilever. The first and obvious thing is the further back in the mouth we go, forces increase. We get closer to our uh, joint. We get closer to the fulcrum. We get increase in stress and we have the potential for the nutcracker effect, class two leverage, which will increase forces on the tooth. If the tooth happens to be a pontic, there's going to be more force on there and therefore more bending force on the abutment tooth. That's number one. And number two, we have something called mesial drift. And all our teeth are measly drifting throughout life. That's why as we get older, we tend to get a little bit more imbrication of our lower teeth. That's why when we low, lose a lower six, the seven tilts forwards, it doesn't tilt backwards. So with the mesial drift, mesial cantilevering sort of fits in with that mesial force that the tooth is used to having. 
they're not used, the teeth are not used to having a distal cantilever force. So those two things together um, leads me and I think other people to suggest that we do distal cantilevers, but we have to increase the uh, abutment numbers uh, and the root surface area of our abutment teeth when we're doing a distal cantilever. And we have to say to our patient, this is not a brilliant idea. Maybe in these instances, implants far better. If the patient can't have an implant, okay, for whatever reason, we have to go with what the science tells us. And what's important again there is to try to stop any over eruption from occurring. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think that uh, that's a common question we, we find, you know, distal cantilever, mesial cantilever based. I think you've uh, answered that very succinctly. So then the, the, the last uh, part of the podcast, so we're going to focus in on, on something that you're very passionate about educating. Because honestly, the, 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 if you actually type in on, on Facebook, fix movable bridges, it's just you just educating dentists on, on the various threads for dentists by dentists, dentists UK, Australian threads, American, you name it, Indian threads. You're just there and you're always, you know, helping people out, actually, you know, design it that way, design it this way. So it's great to see. So I know there's a limitations. Obviously, we're doing this video component, but a lot of people listen to the podcast. There are some limitations and I urge everyone to, to check out the content that you put out there. It's really great on fixed mobile bridges, some cases that you posted before as well. But we can maybe uh, tackle some of the nuances. Um, for example, Let's talk about, uh, uh, let's make it tangible. Let's talk about a scenario and how you would design it. Let's say we have uh, a missing upper right four and five. We have uh, the six, which has uh, got a, a large MO composite. And the canine is got a small, conveniently, a small distal composite. Okay. So missing premolars. We've got canine and first uh, molar, both restored to some degree. How would you design it in the sense that where would the male part of the uh, connector be? Where would the female part be? Uh, any um, advantages of, of doing it in different ways? Um, if you talk about in, in that scenario, if that's okay. Sure. Um, the first thing that we would decide, so when, when we do bridge work and when we do bridge design, we have to go through a scenario whereby we go through treatment planning. We come up with what we think is the ideal. So the, the Prof, actually, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do something. I'm going to show you a photo. I actually have a scenario uh, that I can show you. That is this scenario that I've just remembered. So uh, that'll be really cool for people watching. Sorry to stop you there, Prof. I'm just going no to just show you this. I think it will add more value. Okay. So can we see that? Yes, I can. So there's the canine. It has got a small uh, distal composite. There's uh, the first molar. It's got actually a DO, not an MO composite, so it's fairly close. Um, is that the sort of thing that you had in mind when I when I when I described the case? Yeah, brilliant. So uh, uh, that's a, at least a visual for people to people are visually minded. So yeah, please do carry on about how you were you were saying how we would actually plan and think about bridge work. Yeah. So so we plan a case first of all. We have four stages in planning the case. Okay. Number one is if we've got bridge work potentially in other areas of the mouth. We design the anterior bridge first and then the posterior bridge later. Okay, so that's number one. Always design from the front going backwards. Number two is do you choose your abutment teeth. Certain abutment teeth are not great teeth, such as mobile teeth, such as post grounds where there's no ferrule. And it may well be that you decide that you're going to take a tooth out and make a longer bridge. That will have a better success rate than keeping a poor abutment. The next one is to go and design the actual design itself of the bridge. So is it going to be fixed movable, fixed fixed, cantilever, uh, multiple abutments, um, coping design, that sort of thing. And the final one then is to go and design or choose the actual retainer type. And is that going to be a crown, three quarter crown, inlay, onlay, Maryland wing, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the way in which we'll take every single case. So in this case, um, it is no other bridge work. So we're just going to design that bridge work. We look at the abutment. The three is healthy. The six is healthy. So we have no problems there. We now go and look at the design. So the design is going to be dependent upon mobility. So is the six mobile? No. No mobility the, of either um, team. Three mobile? No. So that gives us the opportunity to go fixed, fixed, or fixed movable. The next thing we'll do then is, again, look at root support. Are they short roots? Are they long roots? I presume the six and the three have got reasonably good roots. Yep. In which case then you have the scenario, do we go fixed, fixed or fixed movable? There's no contraindications 
to fixed movable. And therefore, we go back to our, some of our studies, which show that fixed movables, because they have a stress breaker, there'll be less stress on the abutment teeth, less chance of fracturing off, less stress on the cement loot, less chance of cementation failure, less stress on the porcelain, therefore less chance of porcelain fracturing. Uh, and we go back to some of the studies that say those potential for failures can add up to about 50% of all the failures that occur in bridges versus what's the percentage of failure occurs in bridges due to occlusal overload. And that's about 6%. So you weigh up the two things here and you come to the conclusion, well, I do, that fixed movable would be the better long-term solution. Now, if any of those teeth were mobile, straight into fixed fixed. Okay, so we're into fixed movable. The final stage then is to go and decide what our retainers are going to be. And mm -hmm. we know from our retainers that the best long-term retainer for success is a full crown. However, as we know, full crowns can be very uh, detrimental to uh, tooth destruction, etc. So can we get away with other types of retainer? And we look at the science that says in fixed movables, there's not as much stress on the cement loot. Therefore, we can go with retainers which are not as retentive as a full crown and therefore not as destructive. So for me doing this, I'd look at the six and say, that six looks as though it's got a pretty hefty composite in. Looking yes. at it, that six looks as though those buckle walls are not that thick. Therefore, Correct. I'm probably going to go and do a full crown on that six. That would be my thought process. The distal composite, we know that inlays, for instance, or a Maryland wing would be a reduction in the amount of tooth destruction. So it's going to be a little bit easier for the patient, easier for the enamel, the tooth itself, if you don't go and traumatize it as much. So for me, I've now got the situation, shall I use a distal gold inlay or shall I use a Maryland wing? The Maryland wing is going to obviously change somewhat my guidance. And it may well be, I look at that and say, you know what? The patient doesn't have canine guidance. The canines aren't contacting. And therefore, I'd like to put something onto the palatal aspect to give contact and give guidance. Another part would look at it and say, the canine's fantastic. It's a gorgeous looking tooth. We've got great guidance. The patient's not bruxing. Why change that palatal inclination at all? and therefore I'll go with a distal gold inlay. So that's my thought process. At the end of the day, no one bridge is right or wrong. All we're doing when we design bridge work is we, we try to get three things into every fixed restoration we do. We want maximum longevity. We usually want minimum preparation for that. And we want to get as good of aesthetics as we can. So that can be a single crown. It can be all the way up to a, a eight, 10 unit bridge or whatever. But those are the three factors, and we're always looking to try to get those three factors in our favor. Now, what we do find over the years, however, is that no one restoration will satisfy all three. So we have to make a choice, and we have to usually say to our patient, choose two. Which two out of those three are the most important for you? And then we can design a restoration. So, for instance, if I was going to do that bridge and the patient said, maximum aesthetics, absolutely maximum aesthetics. I'd be probably thinking I'm going to go to Zirconia, but that's going to have to be a fixed, fixed bridge. And so I'm going to have to take more tooth tissue away. If the patient said maximum longevity, I'm probably going to go and put a gold crown on the six as an abutment. So we have to work within those three parameters, but also discuss with the patient what they want. What, what was the third parameter? Sorry, so it's long, longevity, uh, conservation? Longevity, minimal prep, and aesthetics. Aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And we Brilliant. can't, well, any restoration we do, we cannot get all three. We don't have that, that gorgeous uh, scenario. Perfect. Well, uh, uh, since we're doing uh, amazing timing, you've literally covered uh, a blitz through the, the, the bridge work and it's such a, um, I mean, the, the nuggets people are going to take home from, from, from this bit alone is fantastic. So let's just uh, home in on that uh, final part of the design process of the nuances of that fixed movable. If the inlay, if the gold inlay is on the canine and that's facing distally and you have the uh, full coverage retainer on that first molar, 
How do you then instruct the laboratory to design the male and female components? Because uh, I believe there are a couple of ways to do this, and there are a couple of camps. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that and where we can find out more information? For, for me, um, this is a 100%, okay? I know we should never say 100% in dentistry. <laughs> okay, the 99%er, that the fixed movable attachment is always on the distal aspects of the anterior retainer. Okay, so the anterior retainer, in this case, it's going to be the canine, it's going to be a Godian lane, will house the female, which is the slot. Okay, the male portion, which is the rod that fits into the slot, is always connected to the pontic, and the pontic is always connected rigidly to the distal abutment. So for me, it's always in that distal aspect. Um, now, it depends in that distal aspect whereabouts you put it. You could, with this gold inlay idea, you go and drill a box. In your scenario, you've got a, a distal composite. So you're going to drill that distal composite out, tighten the wall so they're a little bit more retentive for an inlay. You've not lost an awful lot of tooth tissue there. But you've got now a box into which the female can be housed. Now, the advantage of this is that when the male bites up and down, the rod goes into the tube. And the tube, the force is now put down the long axis of that canine. So we get really good forces down the long axis. Now, the second scenario, not particularly in this case, but if we're doing, say, a crown, a full crown with a, a female attachment. The second scenario is now that the rod and tube, we do not cut a box. So to get the female down the long axis, we have to cut a box. And that box is usually about two millimeters wide, two millimeters deep. Now, if that's a perfectly healthy tube, let's say the we're doing uh, using an upper four, and the upper four has an MO, but nothing distally. You then say to yourself, should I cut a distal box, a four millimeter square distal box, just to house that female so forces can go down the long axis, versus if I just do a normal crown preparation, my attachment will now be slightly off axis. So when I bite up and down, there'll be some off axis forces. What's the root like on the four? Does the four have a good root and good bone support? In which case, potentially it can take that stress. So again, always on the distal of, of the anterior abutment, but it can be housed internally on the edge or externally. The other aspect that we should know about the fixed movable is the technician initially, he buys this from a company uh, such as Sondra Matur or something like that. It's a plastic burnout and he waxes it into his reconstruction so that the male actually bottoms out and hits the bottom of the female. So that's how it's returned to the dentist. Now, as a dentist, as a clinician, we need to therefore take a little bit off the base of the male to allow this movement to occur. So if you just cement it in place, without the, having adjusted the base of the male, it's now acting under load like a fixed fix. This is a really key, key point here. So those listening and watching right now, you have to really uh, home in on that because that, that could be a complete waste of you doing the fixed movable. So Absolutely. what Prof is saying, you have to remove uh, the, the base of the male so that it has that sort of uh, give and that space to, to, to actually uh, act as, as a stress breaker, which is the whole point. That's a really, really key point. And we usually take about a quarter of a millimeter off it. Um, the lovely thing also about fixed movables is that we can selectively put more stress onto one of the abutments. With a fixed fixed bridge, you bite on it, both abutments take the stress. And therefore, if you have one weak abutment, there's no way you can protect it. Now, with a fixed movable, if I have a weak abutment, especially if my anterior abutment is weaker, if I take a little bit more than my quarter of a millimeter off, that's throwing more stress onto my distal abutment, protecting my anterior abutment. So we can play around with the nuances there and protect teeth to get that extra little bit of longevity even more. That is Absolutely fantastic. Honestly, Prof, you've, you've given such um, concise uh, learning points there for Bridges. I'm, I'm absolutely really pleased with all the knowledge you've given. I know I'm going to get loads of messages saying, wow, Prof just gave out all, <laughs> all the answers in such a great way. So I'm, I'm really, really happy with, with all that. To be honest with you. You've answered every single question I, I had about Bridges. Um, this is, uh, look, 
this is a complex field. Every scenario, every mouth, every um, every patient is unique. So that um, any time I give you a scenario uh, and you have its methodological system to go through and design, but at the end of the day, every case will be different, and there'll be some nuance in each case. For those wanting to to learn more and 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 uh, go on any hands-on training that you might have about this, can you tell us a bit more about how we can come onto those? Yes. Um, so. At Tipton Training, as you're aware, uh, we've been doing courses, um, PG certificates, diplomas for, for many, many years. And we've been doing this for, I hate to think, it's about 25 years now. Uh, and the courses have obviously evolved as dental science evolves. Um, but we do um, a full day on bridge design, which is, it is a full day to understand it fully. Uh, it's going through the papers and I'm, I'm a big one for self-discovery. Uh, I'm not when we do our courses. I don't like to just lecture to people. I think lecturing is a really poor way of getting knowledge across. So when I went down to the Eastman all those years ago to do my master's degree, it was the first time that I'd ever experienced sitting in a group around a table and discussing things and having a mentor lead the discussion. The mentor knew where he wanted to lead it, but everybody else in that room was discovering things for the first time. And that really stays in your mind. So what we do to teach bridge design is we go through about 20 papers and I lead the discussion and I let the, the guys in the room go, ah, that's why we're doing that. And that just stays with people. So it's a far better education method. Um, so our down bridge design, we have about 10 till two in, in the afternoon where we do four hours. It's a tough day of pure science the lectures. We then have a lunch break, and then I follow that up with two hours of slides, going through my lecture, showing, obviously, photos, case scenarios, etc. Uh, and then we also have a, a full day on the uh, Phantom Head, the operative course that we do at Tipton Training, where they go into the lab. They have uh, webinars before that, so they can get all their information again via webinars, and then they spend from 10 o'clock till 5 o'clock prepping various bridge designs, which we put in front of them. Uh, so that's how, how we part, do that. That's part of our uh, restorative courses. Um, I don't go and do any other one day courses on bridge design because I think for bridge design, you have to understand dentistry. As you're trying to get through there and you made the point really well, the nuances are key and the nuances come hey. This is why, Prof, I, I had you on, but I realized that, you know, for a lot of people, this might be the first time they're learning about fixed movables. I have a very, very young audience uh, uh, and, and they may be learning about fixed movables first time. So I don't want anyone to go away thinking that they listen to this podcast episode and now they can uh, confidently do maybe with some mentorship. Yeah, fair enough. There are some great dents out there. But I think for those who want to really uh, get to the meat and potatoes to to consider, and I, I, I like what you said about the aha moments. Um, I, I think last year I went to your uh, Watford one day at the Hilton, um, amongst other things. I've uh, been to yours as well. Uh, and uh, that, that I, I definitely remember having some aha moments there. So I, I like your teaching style. So I think definitely that's a takeaway point to make sure that, yeah, you got this introductory knowledge about fixed nobles, but you may need to find out more about the nuances because it really is about the nuances. I mean, we haven't even covered about the cementation and how to do that. So there's, there's so, so much practical stuff to learn still. Yep, and, and you know, with every bridge, we can't get around, it's the elephant in the room, the big O, occlusion. So occlusion matters hugely as to how long that bridge will last, whether you get the guidance right, whether you get the five principles of occlusion, whether you manage to get no class two leverage, you convert it to class three leverage, whether your pontics are discluding or not. So we've got that. You've got another huge topic, which is tooth preparation, to make sure that you understand resistance retention form and how with a bridge you need to increase especially with fixed fix resistance retention form we've got lab techniques uh, and most dent dentists unfortunately don't understand lab techniques and throughout the course we we're always going on about visit your lab talk to your lab about lab techniques uh, as an aside um if you don't mind me for just a minute one of the major influences on my life my dental life was going down to the eastman and doing my master's degree. And as we did my master's degree, it was a two year degree. Uh, and I went down there three days a week for two, for two years from Manchester. Uh, and during the daytime, usually from nine till one, it was a seminar. 
from two till five, 5.30, we did our practical on patients. But then from 5.30 till nine o'clock, we're in the lab doing our own lab work. And this is a huge key. You look at any successful restorative dentist, prosthodontist around the world, okay, name the top 10. They've either been trained as a technician first, Christian coachman, someone like that, or they've got really good technical ability and they've learned how to do the technical side of things. So again, a take home message to all the um, young dentists out there is understand what your technician does. You're in a partnership. You cannot get away from that partnership. He needs to understand what you do. You need to understand what he does. And so the mechanical principles of casting, of milling, fixed movable joints, how they're made, uh, dice spacer, things like that are so essential. And technicians every single day when they're doing your lab work face about 10 or 15 decisions how they're going to do your lab work. And they might go down the wrong route or the right route. Okay, And very often that's due to financial constraints. You need to be there saying, right route, please, right route, please. Keep on going on the straight and narrow. And that way you get better long-term results. The, the more you can understand about the technical side, the more uh, you can communicate with your technician in a language that you both mm-hmm. understand because it, yeah. they are different ways of thinking about it. So it, to, I, I completely echo what you're saying to, to have that uh, sort of communication with the laboratory, that relationship with the lab, which will really help you because they can make great mentors. But also I, yeah. I say is that even though your technician, even if they're twice your age, will always benefit from your ideas as a dentist as well because they might come to some of your courses and then come uh, to your way of thinking and they may have been missing a key point in the technical aspect. So I think they can learn something from us and we can learn a lot from them as well. So I think that's a, a great point, point you raised there. Yep, yep. So, Prof, uh, but before I say goodbye, there's uh, one more uh, thing I just remembered I, f- I forgot to ask you is when you're, and this is gonna, this is going to be my protrusive dental pearl, and be like, okay, so Prof gave me this pearl for today. And this is when you're placing grooves for, for uh, crowns and bridges. Is there a rule in terms of, yep. uh, for example, do gr- the grooves for crowns need to be mesial and distal, and for bridges, they need to be buccal and lingual? Is there a sort of um, a guideline that, that how to, uh, where to place your grooves yes. for certain restorations? Can you please uh, share that with me? So grooves are placed for single crowns and for bridges differently. So first of all, we have to go reason for a groove. We extra retention because of surface area, but it's mostly for resistance form. So the groove will not stop the crown being pulled off this way, okay? The groove will give you resistance form, which means the crown being pushed off from a non-axial direction of force. So if we look at normal crowns and you sell together, grind from side to side, it's usually a buccolingual force that will, so if that's the direction buccolingually, then we put our grooves at 90 degrees to the direction of force. So for a single crown, we'll put our groove either mesial or distal, or mesial and distal. That will give us more resistance form. So the question then comes, is it mesial, is it distal? Um, The rules state that you're better off putting the groove in tooth tissue than you are putting it in restoration. If you put it in restoration, then the resistance form is directly Um, due to the actual resistance form of the restoration, which might not be very good. We've all had times where we've prepped a tooth, taken the impression, and the cores come out. So sometimes that's not brilliant. Um, Next thing is, is your groove parallel-sided or tapered? Parallel-sided will give you more resistance form, tapered a little bit less. If you're putting multiple grooves in, you've got to make sure that those multiple grooves are parallel and not like this. Then we come on to bridges and we look at bridges and we say, okay, first thing, grooves for resistance form. What direction of force will bring a bridge off? Now, it's not tends to not to be buccolingual. It's now anteroposterior. So the usual thing is we bite on the anterior abutment and the posterior wants to rotate off. So it's anteroposterior. And Chan did a good paper, T-J-A-N, looking at the anterior and the posterior abutments the posterior is always under more stress, the cement loot. And therefore, with a bridge, which is going to be a posterior one, I seldom put a groove in the anterior abutment, always put a groove in the posterior abutment. Okay? And now, because it's going to be an anteroposterior direction of force 
which brings the bridge off. Okay, where do we put our grooves? Our grooves are now placed buccal or lingual or buccal and lingual. And don't forget also, an, an important part here, we can also get resistance form, increased retention as well, occlusally. So very often we will be doing a bridge prep, a crown prep, on a tooth that's got an occlusal amalgam. For goodness sake, take the occlusal amalgam out. Make it into an inlay. If it's an MOD amalgam, put a slot down it. And again, you're going to get several things. You're going to get increased rigidity. Rigidity is really important with bridge work. You'll get increased rigidity. You'll get increased resistance and retention form. And the other thing that we find with most crowns and bridges posteriorly, if you look at 100 crown and bridges, okay, units, aesthetically, the area where most uh, technicians and dentists struggle is when they're doing occlusal reduction, they never reduce enough in the central fossa. So if my cusp angles are like this, the prep cusp angles are like that, okay? By putting a groove mesiodistally, you're now allowing the technician to get a really nice deep central fossa, which will also increase aesthetics. So don't forget the occlusal surface. The occlusal surface is really important. What a fantastic, comprehensive reply. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. That, that's been a, a really, really uh, educational session. I really appreciate, appreciate you coming on the show. I know how busy you are, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's been a great chat. I'll let you know when this episode's out, and then for everyone to, to, to listen to as well. Uh, I hope you have a, a lovely summer, and I hope you get back into the swing of things with the, with the courses and the clinics and whatnot. Thank you very much, Dennis. It's been a pleasure talking. Any other time, happy to do another one. It's been Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So there we have it. Loads and loads of bridge work gems, as I promised. I hope you found that useful. I've had so many superstars on recently. Honestly, I've been, I've been quite blessed. Uh, so yeah, as always, uh, thanks for listening all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. And I'll join you in the next episode.